understanding of of human well-being and and how people recover from a substance use disorder and or other mental health conditions. I just want to open the panel with just a, a bit of a general disclaimer that some of the, the subject matter that we are talking about here today, um, some of it is recognized under a therapeutic context. Some of it is currently being studied in clinical trials and so has not achieved full FDA approval yet uh, for some of the substances that we'll be discussing. And other substances are protected by indigenous rights and religious rights and heritage. Um, and outside of those contexts, these substances largely are still criminalized. Uh, and so it's just important to note that what we're talking about here today uh, can look very different for different people, depending on the context in which um, those substances are being used. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into our presentation. So my name is, is Michael Gallopo. I'm a recovery advocate with the Dutchess County Behavioral and Community Health Department. Um, this panel has come out of a, a multi-year discussion uh, about the importance of psychedelics in recovery. And so I wanted to, to bring a diverse representation because of the, the nature of recovery being both um, treatment, clinical, medical, healing, but also spiritual and transformative and cultural. And so making sure that all of those perspectives were represented uh, in a fashion that um, really represented the diversity within the psychedelics movement. So I'd like to hand it over briefly to each of our speakers to just do a brief introduction so we can all get to know who you are. And then we'll we'll dive into the panel discussion. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A. We'll do our best to address those questions uh, at the end of our, our opening presentation. So without further ado, Craig. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm coming through clean. Cool. My name is Craig Salerno. I'm a licensed addiction counselor and licensed professional counselor working out here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my clinical practice working in conventional treatment models. So working in intensive outpatient, residential programs, detox programs, and kind of rose the ranks, worked as a counselor and then a therapist, and then was doing uh, clinical directing at a place called North Star Transitions for um, three or four years. Um, got super interested in the idea of utilizing psychedelic medicine with addiction, kind of proposed the option of bringing that into the conventional treatment model, was told no, uh, not yet, um, at which point I jumped into private practice and I've been doing ketamine assisted psychotherapy in private practice for people with addiction uh, for the last two and a half years or so. Um, so my practice is out here in Boulder. I do, I'm born and raised in the Northeast in New Jersey, so feel feel excited to be connected to the New York uh, conference and uh, good to see everyone. I'm excited we're having this chat this morning. Excellent. Thank you, Craig. Ronald? Good morning. Uh, Ron Bowman. I'm, um, I'll be talking to you about my personal experiences with long-term uh, recovery, uh, relapse after long-term recovery, and some uncommon treatments, uh, medically supervised treatments that I, uh, I received to help me with uh, depression and trauma. It's kind of an accelerated um, therapy of ketamine and MDMA. I'm just out of the um, the phase uh, phase three studies of double blinded studies for MDMA sponsored by MAPS and uh, the FDA. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, my traumas and a little bit about um, how these drugs um, enhance my recovery, both uh, from substances and uh, and life. Donald, Diana. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Diana Min. I'm an empowerment coach and a spiritual mentor. I work mainly in private practice and I work mainly with a sacred plant medicine, ayahuasca, helping people overcome trauma and addiction uh, through the sacred plant medicine. And um, I have actually been in recovery now for six years going on seven um, through the same holistic medicine of the sacred plant medicine. And um, yeah, I'm here to talk about my personal experience of recovery and also my experience with helping other people overcome their addictions and their traumas uh, through the sacred work. Thank you, Diana and Catherine. All right. Hey, my name is Catherine. Um, I'm coming from a background of both personal experience uh, with psychedelics and then also I've been um, a trip sitter or guide or whatever you want to call it uh, for various individuals looking for um, harm reduction specialists to sit with them during their experiences. 
Um, I am in recovery from a severe binge purge eating disorder um, that has sort of tapered off through the years and I used um, uh, various psychedelic substances to help me get through that and to help build a more authentic life that supported it. So my focus is going to be really on um, integration uh, to sustain long-term change. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. And I did want to mention that we did have a, a fifth panelist who unfortunately is having some, some internet issues, Dr. Nico Grunman, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Ember Health in New York City. Uh, he's got you know, many years experience in emergency care as a physician and, and now is the chief medical officer for a fairly large ketamine assisted therapy practice here in New York. Uh, if folks are interested in some of the talking points that he brings. I do have a recording of a panel from Bard College earlier this year where he speaks mm -hmm. on a lot of the talking points that we did intend to bring forward in this panel. And I'm happy to share that and make that recording available for folks that are, are interested in learning more about the medical perspective. So I did wanna just offer that as, as an option. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna you know lend this space to our esteemed panel. Um, so Craig, if you wanna open this up, please take things away. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so just to kind of clarify, and I think Ron spoke to this a little bit and Michael as well, like there are certain legal medicines that are being utilized by psychotherapists, medically supervised, therapeutically supervised. I'm gonna really be speaking from that lens today. Um, so less so kind of the underground work or working with the other indigenous medicines. And ketamine is the actual only legal psychedelic medicine being used by therapists currently. Um, unless it's through a research trial or through MAPS work, um, ketamine is really the only medicine we're working with legally in the uh, private practice realm. <clears throat> so I'll be speaking about that and just talking about my experience doing ketamine psychotherapy with people pursuing recovery. And again, I just want to say, I mean, two, two years ago, I was trying to have this conversation with the owners of the agency I worked for, and they said, no, 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 this is too taboo. We can't open a phase three psychedelic clinic. That's, you know, people would go crazy. This is not acceptable. And just to see the amount of movement in two years, I'm just, it's, this is unbelievable to be talking about psychedelics and addiction. So here we are. Um, so important thing to note for me um, is uh, ketamine assisted psychotherapy that the main reason I'm doing this is to aid psychotherapy so there are different styles of how we do ketamine therapy the way I'm going to be speaking about it is doing a conjunction treatment of traditional talk psychotherapy with the ingestion of ketamine as a, as a medicine and I'll tell you a little bit about ketamine for those of you that are unfamiliar so ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic dissociative meaning it kind of pulls us away from our typical bodily experience Anesthetic, meaning when it's used at a particular dose, it will actually put you under. <clears throat> the way we're using ketamine psychotherapeutically is a much lower dose than the anesthetic dose. So we're not putting people out. Um, rather, we're working with a very low dose, and it tends to actually induce psychedelic experience. Um, so what is psychedelic experience? You can just kind of guess based on your association with the word. There's a lot of visual experience, spiritual experience, increased insight and awareness seeing life and your frame from a different vantage point and just experiencing an altered state of consciousness. So your ordinary perception of yourself and your issue, your trauma, your difficulties, everything gets rearranged and, and we kind of get a, a new bend and a new look at our lives. So I'm offering ketamine assisted psychotherapy in private practice and it tends to look a particular way when we use it in private practice. And it's important mm. to know it's always in combination and collaboration with a medical team. So as a psychotherapist, I can't be doing the medicine or um, letting people know about the dose. So we do bring in a medical team. They do a medical evaluation of clients, making sure this is a safe medicine for individuals. There's very few contraindications, meaning ketamine plays very well with other medicines. It's pretty low risk. People have been using it for, I mean, since the early 1900s in medical treatment settings. Um, so it's, it's a very safe medicine. Um, so the medical team will ensure a client is um, a safe candidate psychotherapeutically will make sure it makes sense from more of the emotional, spiritual, cognitive side. It's approved. We'll kind of bring these two teams on board, the medical, the therapeutic work with a client and initiate a ketamine treatment. <clears throat> so when we're using ketamine assisted psychotherapy, the treatment, um, is usually a combination of what we call preparation sessions. So this is building rapport, getting to know a client, setting a roadmap, setting goals and orientation towards what the work's going to look like. 
um, educating them about the altered state if they're unfamiliar, how to best navigate that, teaching mindfulness. And we'll do six to eight prep sessions before we even initiate ketamine um, into the treatment. We then follow that by a series of ketamine sessions. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of what that looks like, but they're taking the medicine, usually an oral dose of ketamine in our session. It's about a three hour session. They'll administer the medicine. They're gonna lay flat, eye shades, kind of the typical psychedelic therapy kind of frame. Music will be playing and we're actually targeting the underlying traumas that tend to perpetuate addiction. So different than just having a psychedelic experience and just kind of letting things happen, we're actually targeting and moving towards therapeutic content. Mm. I'll talk a little bit about why ketamine helps that process. Usually we do a series of ketamine treatments. So anywhere from three sessions to six sessions over the course of a month, um, the medicine tends to work best in, in accumulation. So back to back to back. And then after the ketamine series, we put the medicine aside, we focus on integration and, and really focus on understanding what came up, processing some of the things that came up in the experience. Um, and we tend not to revisit the ketamine unless absolutely necessary. So ketamine as a medicine helps psychotherapy in a very specific way. Um, and it's kind of twofold. So it naturally acts as an antidepressant. So just ingesting ketamine, if, even if you didn't do it with psychotherapy, you tend to get a rapid relief from depressive symptoms. As most people know, early recovery, kind of depression could be the name of the game. A lot of anhedonic feelings, really struggling with emotional connection and ketamine can tend to reduce some of those depressive symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that neurochemically, ketamine acts on the glutamate receptor, which is an activating neurochemical, which tends to induce fear, panic and protection. And it lowers that part of our system. So you can imagine as we're navigating towards trauma, really looking at these underlying pieces, when you ingest ketamine, the system is in a much better place to explore and to do therapy. Um, so really it just aids the psychotherapeutic process in a really powerful mm -hmm. way. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, with that, as they're in the experience, the music playing, they're also having spiritual insight, increased awareness of what's going on, maybe seeing things from a different vantage point, and they can almost look at their addiction as like an outside object. I've had someone call it almost like this vi viral part of themselves that they're kind of witnessing the way it man maneuvers and the way it manipulates and, and they're watching it from a far perspective. And that dissociative quality of separation is actually really a big therapy. So I don't know where I'm at with time here. Maybe I have a couple more minutes here to just yeah. Sure. You're good. So the integration. So we, we deepen into the therapeutic process with ketamine. We're doing a series of sessions. People are really working in that. Way. We're doing integration and integration is really focused on how do we go excavate these experiences with the ketamine, using the medicine, grab them out, make the ketamine obsolete, and then really focus on integrating and actually um, initiating our process. So the idea here is to really make ketamine a short term mm -hmm. part of the treatment and not a long-term consistent thing we need to tap into. And you can imagine the benefit of this versus um, taking consistent psychic medications that are more daily and they do relieve symptoms, but it's a long-term relationship. Ketamine, at least the way we're doing it, is considered a short-term relationship with a psychedelic medicine to help aid and kind of bridge us through our recovery process in the beginning. And then we kind of let go of the ketamine and continue on. So some of the benefits that I really like to think about, so again, going through withdrawal and these anhedonic phases in the beginning of recovery, it just really helps to have ketamine on board to reduce some of the symptoms. Um, my clients tend to really appreciate the novelty of the experience. Um, it's almost like an alternate rebellion. So some piece of addiction is it's edgy and it, we kind of get to push our limits. With ketamine therapy, you kind of get to itch that, scratch that itch, but in a very safe, supportive setting. Um, I call it a psychedelic carrot tends to reduce relapse and recidivism because we know once a week we're getting an altered state, um, which in some ways can be captivating for a client. And again, it's kind of like working in this harm reduction model um, where they know they're going to be in a safe environment. They're going to be utilizing a psychedelic. They're going to feel an altered state, but it's in a safe, supportive way. Um, so that kind of flips addiction on its head too. So altering ourselves, but in the safety and with the intention to heal as opposed to move away from our pain. And then this other piece is that it really supports the spiritual. As most people know, it's, it's a huge part of this. It tends to initiate spiritual experience in a powerful way. Um, but overall, I would say it deepens the therapy and it quickens the therapy. And those are two things when we're working with addiction that are really valuable. Important to mention the cons. So there, there is the possibility of someone getting 
um, too emotionally connected to the ketamine experience or wanting to develop more of an abusive relationship with ketamine. I'd say it's very rare. I've worked with many, many clients and it's rare that people want to do this on their own because it tends to be a pretty bizarre experience. Um, there are some safety concerns with prescribing ketamine and having people keep it at their home. So we found creative ways to adjust that. Um, and then it's important to recognize ketamine still being researched. Um, we're kind of early in this phase of understanding the long-term benefits of ketamine and the long-term impact of ketamine. So it's an alternative treatment. And what I always say is let's try psychotherapy first. Let's try conventional treatment. And if those things aren't working, we can shift gears and kind of move. I've had a handful of clients come to me specifically to work with ketamine. We did therapy in this prep work. They got sober and we never touched the ketamine. And that to me is a great, a great process as well. So, yeah, with that said, I just want to say this is not a magic bullet, but it definitely can aid and support recovery. Um, we need to do a lot more research into it, but also I think people deserve to have access to these forms of treatment. I would love to see it get integrated into conventional treatment as an option. Um, and again, we're really turning addiction on its head. So instead of using a medicine to move away from our pain and suffering, um, we're using a medicine to go towards it, to heal. And that to me is a very profound uh, shift. So, yeah of what it looks like. I had a late 20s alcoholic come in. He had tried conventional treatment, 12-step model, in and out of recovery, in and out of the rooms, in and out of residential treatment, came and did ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. We worked weekly with ketamine, I think, for seven weeks or eight weeks. Um, rapid relief from some of the emotional underpinnings, got to process trauma that he's never touched in any of his pre previous treatment stays because it was pretty locked up. Um, immediate abstinence. He had a, a relapse around eight months and then had a pretty rapid rebound to recovery. Um, but these are some of the things that we can see. It's just kind of like this rapid trauma processing, um, potential of immediate sobriety and, and recovery. And I mean, that's what it could look like. So I'll leave it there and then I'll, I'll pass it to our next panelist. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Craig. Ronald. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Good morning. I'm um, Ron Bowman. Uh, married husband, uh, father of five. Um, I guess if I have a unique perspective on the topic, it's a guy in recovery who's no longer middle-aged or young, um, trying some uncommon treatments uh, for mental health and recovery. Um, 61 years old. Um, I came into the rooms uh, of, of AA uh, November 1st, 1987. And having been in the room since 1987, I've, I've noticed a change in recovery and the themes and uh, of recovery. I, I like to think of that period of time as um, fairly vigilant. If you were sharing about things that didn't have to do with substances or alcohol specifically, they might have walked you out or shut you down. Um, it was fairly vigilant. It was about alcohol and alcoholism. Um, and that was my brand of recovery. That's important to note because when you came in, I think sometimes defines how you are or what brand of recovery you have. So I say that because psychedelics, you know, were, I didn't, I didn't do them when I was active. I drank a lot. I did a tremendous amount of cocaine. Um, I never did psychedelics. I just had, I had no reference point. Um, uh, father was an alcoholic. Grandfather's an alcoholic. Uh, grandfather committed suicide. Dad murdered. Um, bunch of trauma growing up. Details important, but not uh, you know, not, not that important. Just a lot of us in recovery have experienced trauma. And I, I, sh I think I shared with Mike not too long ago that, you know, AA doesn't treat trauma. It, they're like the fire department. They, they don't, they don't replace anything. They just tell you what's left, you know? So it's not all this, not all the trauma stuff that, that I've been through. There was a step attached to, uh, and it kind of went unspoken because it really didn't have a lot to do with substances. It had a lot to do with events in my life that just kind of, step over the body. So, so November 1st, 1987, get sober, get married, have kids, jobs get better, houses get bigger. Good, good, good. Um, I'm running with a pack of vigilant recovery guys and the gals and, and, and it was good and it was good. And it was good enough. Right. And I, I knew I wasn't touching the third rail of various parts of my life. Uh, I did my steps. I had always had a sponsor. Um, I was always engaged. Um, but there was stuff that just was, I don't know, man. Just it wasn't for the rooms, right? So '93, the um, the towers uh, get bombed, and it it kind of, uh, for what I do professionally, it kind of enhanced my career, right? And then um, I'm doing mission critical work and disaster recovery work around the world for financial institutions and 
and uh, various mission critical uh, companies. And uh, 93, I had my own company at two companies. And uh, on uh, September 11th, just on a hundred dollar bet, I wasn't, I was working on the 101st and 105th floors uh, for Cantor Fitzgerald. I lost um, a crew of six and about 20 friends. We were talking to them when they were dying. And I never really took that to the rooms, right? Because it didn't have anything to do with with uh, with uh, alcohol, right? So I get into endurance sports uh, to put out the fire, and uh, I race like a maniac for about 15 years. I take the injuries, I take the opiates, I go into relapse after long-term sobriety. Over 20 years of sobriety, I relapse, which is a pretty big deal for a guy that grew up with vigilant AA. I call it cranky AA. When you give back your time, you, you give back, you know, the only – the, the only thing I had done perfectly uh, my entire life. And it's a big deal. And it's worth noting. I was up in Syracuse after, and the guy comes after me. I'm, I'm crying about my story. I'm crying. I'm crying. He says, you know, 70% of the long timers that give back their time commit suicide. And I knew exactly what he meant. So I was casually suicidal since the events of September 11th, uh, casually suicidal, um, not in a good space, not in a good space. And, um, Ketamine uh, was, it was a random meeting. Ketamine was suggested with therapy. Um, appreciate uh, Greg's description of it. Mine was a little more like, boom, baby. Like I took the injection. I, I heard a train. I smelt brownies and there was no hand. There was no job. There was no wife. There were no kids. It was basically the death of ego. Like, and, and I can talk about it. Um, and that was helpful. It was very helpful for my depression. I thought it was going to treat the PTSD. I did it about 15 times. There were some benefits in doing it regularly. And then I think the benefits wore. Um, so I'm grateful for that treatment. Uh, I was a reluctant dude. Like I was 57 or 56 when I did it. I'm, I'm just not that guy. And what's important to mention is for those of us in recovery, I just did not want breadcrumbs back to another relapse. Like I, my, my last run active was three, eight balls on an empty stomach driving around my kids. Like I don't, you know, I'm, I've got a nasty, nasty, nasty case of this disease. So the idea that I was willing to, to take ketamine was a, was a big deal. It's a really big deal. For those who learned AA in the 80s and cranky AA, no mood altering substances, it didn't change my mood. It changed me. It was a big, big risk. And I took it because I was casually suicidal. Um, so th uh, at the same time, the study for MDMA is coming up. I know nothing about Molly. I know nothing about ecstasy. The, the therapist is like, just put your hat in there. Just see if you can get in. And there were about 50,000 of us. That they took 1,300 phone interviews, 750, 550, 250. I get into the final 91. It's a double-blinded study for MDMA. And I'm, I'm hating the gating process. I'm about to take another mood-altering substance. I don't like that. I'm telling my sponsor I don't like that. You know, is it a planned relapse? Is, am, I asking, am I sincerely asking for help? You know, so... All these questions are just really busy between my ears. And, and for a guy that just gave back his, his time, it was, a, it was a big risk for me, right? Um, what I found in the three sessions uh, was a very squishy place to have a very honest conversation with myself on very tough topics, um, very safe, very warm. Um, uh, it was not, I knew once I got in that space, this was not a planned relapse. It, that this was, this was good. This was, I can have a conversation. I, if, if all I wanted to get out of this whole MDMA study was to stop crying, I would have made that bet. I just could not stop crying. I just could, I couldn't stop. So I come out of the treatment. It's, 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 it's like taking 25 years of therapy in four months. And if you've ever seen like a space show where they go into hyperspeed and the skin on their face pulls back, their fingers are all white knuckled. It's like from a therapy point of view, you are, you are accelerated. So now we stop the acceleration and it's like, whew, so I will tell you that after my therapy, I was suicidal and it lasted about four to six weeks. Um, it was bad. Right. And I didn't see that coming. Um, it was bad. It was really bad. And uh, and it's not uncommon from what I understand. I'm telling you my story. But from those I talked to, it's like, no, man, once you once you take that rocket ship ride, um, there's stuff to sort out. This is not this is not fairy dust. This is not a unicorn treatment. Um, this is this is not for the faint of heart that it may not go your way, but it was a risk I was willing to take. Um, and I will tell you, I'm grateful I took the risk. Uh, I took the risk of relapse. I took the risk that I would be worse off. Um, but my experience both with ketamine uh, and MDMA was uh, painful, but favorable. 
And, and that's just my journey. Um, what I've learned, and then oh, in my third session of MDMA, there was one, I got sexually abused as a kid. I was in camp and the counselor tied me to a tree and had his way with me. And that one had never come up in, in all of my recovery and any of my ketamine, but in a safe place of MDMA, I just told the story about that abuse to the two therapists. And I just told the story like I'm talking to you. And at the end of it, I said, that was so fucked up. And they said, yeah, that was pretty fucked up. And that's all that needed to be said. So I speak to you casually about it because it doesn't have any power. It's out, right? I don't think that would have come out doing another round of steps or getting another sponsor. You know, in my case, I believe that in that safe space, I could say things that I never said before without consequence. So that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So I will tell you that um, I've learned that we do the work and we do the healing. I believe the answers are inside. Um, yeah, don't expect anybody to pull it out of you. I look at, it's not, there is no recovering from, uh, in my view, trauma. I think we, like a drunk, we, we will die with trauma. It's, it's um, uh, how you let it affect you. So what it has done for me, as I look back, is I have choices in the moment when life is decided. When I come to this story of my sexual abuse, I have a choice. I can decide whether I want to go down the emotional trauma story and the tears come, or I could tell you a story about a part of my life. And that's a conscious decision I never had before. That's a choice. My trauma today is a choice. I don't always win in that moment. I won just now. I'll win again and definitely better for it. This would not have happened in my view without taking the MDMA and having, having the therapy. So that's kind of my story. I'm grateful. It, it you know, I, I was banged up afterwards. That's my journey. Um, but I'm grateful that I both took the ketamine and the MDMA. I continue to go to AA. I don't talk about it in the rooms. I didn't give back my time. I don't count time anymore. I don't care about the chips. I don't care about the cake. I don't care about the coffee. You know, I'm on my own path of recovery. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing, I'm doing, I'm doing much better. That's my story. And, and I love that you pointed out the importance of having a safe space to just be able to speak your truth. And I think a part of the importance of this panel was to have a space for people living in recovery to be encouraged to speak and explore their truth because we're not alone. You know, just about all of us in this room have had our own experiences. So I'm just really appreciative of being able to create that space for all of us to be able to share our truth. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Diana. Thank you, Ronald. Um, thank you, Ron, for that share. It's really beautiful. Um, I can relate to so many aspects of your story. Um, so I, I'm here in San Diego. I'm from New York originally. Um, first generation of immigrant parents growing up in New York City. Um, really, really tough childhood. My mother was bipolar. Um, and so I had a lot of vicious abuse um, my entire life, my entire childhood. Um, from moments I can't remember into moments that I can remember up until I left home around 17 for college. So um, I became an alcoholic pretty early, around like 14, began using drugs um, probably around that time, 14, 15, and would be like a raging alcoholic uh, for the majority of my life and um, pretty, um, a, just a pretty frequent drug abuser um, all throughout that time. Um, uh, it would lead me to living a very, very um, traumatic life in New York City after college, um, you know, being being drugged, being raped, being in very um, just unfortunate situations due to my alcoholism um, and being arrested, being violent, all of these things. Um, up until about the age of 26, um, when I just... I guess, you know, in the spiritual community, we call it a dark night of the soul. Um, maybe in the medical community, we call it a mental breakdown. <laughs> and um, just really finding myself in that place. I had tried, I was suicidal around the age of 12. Um, and so at this point, 26 was really when it resurfaced. And so um, 
I had seen my mother on medication her entire life. And so I was very um, adverse to taking any type of medication, seeing how that it numbed her, it killed her, and it, it just didn't make anything better. It's worse. Um, and so I sought out a shamanic healer out in Brooklyn, New York, and I worked with her for about six months uh, doing shamanic work, um, which if any of you are familiar with shamanic healing, it is uh, it is more quantum, it is spiritual, it is deep, it is moving things um, through the lineage. You know, a lot of our trauma, um, like Ron touched on, is coming down through the bloodline. Um, there is addiction in my family. There is a lot of mental illness in my family. Um, at this point, I didn't realize that I had PTSD, borderline personality disorder, OCD, anxiety, and depression. Um, and, uh, and I was an extremely violent person. And so working through w with the shamanic healer, it would eventually lead me to my first ayahuasca ceremony, um, in New York that basically completely changed and transformed my life. Um, I went in there not knowing what to expect, not knowing what I was doing, not really even knowing what it was, but feeling a deep calling um, in my soul to attend this particular ceremony, um, which a lot of the people that are coming to ceremonies now kind of feel that same way. It's the it's a call, right? She calls you. Um, when we talk about the medicine, when we talk about ayahuasca, you know, she is the great grandmother spirit of the earth. Um, it's a very soft, loving, feminine spirit. And so if I'm ever referring it to she or her, that's kind of what I'm talking to. So she kind of calls you into that space. And when I got called into that space, I was able to see my life from this aerial view. And for the first time, kind of like that separation that Craig was speaking about, being able to see separate myself from my trauma and all the pain and suffering that I was experiencing. And as I saw myself from this aerial view, it's almost I was with, you know, what whether we want to call it a higher power, you know, divine intelligence, God. Um, and I was seeing myself almost as if I was a little, a little mouse in this little maze and seeing that every, you know, traumatic event, every violent experience, every unfortunate tragedy that I had experienced in my life was actually given to me and strategically placed in my path so that I could experience it and then lead me to that exact moment where I was in a, in a ceremony ex being able to see it and actually have gratitude towards it and and really change my perspective on you know my life instead of being a victim it actually empowered me to really understand that i was building strength i was building resilience i was building wisdom um through that experience and and really releasing a lot of that anger and that pain um from that experience, I did not expect to get sober. However, after that, trying to drink alcohol, I would get violently sick because ayahuasca actually really detests alcohol. And um, so she basically would not allow me to take another sip of alcohol again. Um, and at that point, I was like a raging alcoholic. And so it was very strange. It was very bizarre. I would try to drink. I would get violently sick. I would try to do drugs. I would get violently sick. And so it just started to associate, you know, drugs and alcohol with this like terrible, like sickening experience, which just deterred me away from doing it at all. The the medicine, you know, ayahuasca, the way it's so intelligent and sacred and um, kind of just beyond our uh, conscious comprehension because it works beyond the ceremony. A lot of, you know, these substances or, you know, methods of healing that we're using, it works when you take the medicine. This medicine is the only medicine that works before you take the medicine. And then it start, begins to use to work after the medicine is done, after you leave ceremony, after the medicine is gone from your body, because it's a spirit, right? So it's working in and out of your life. And so from that point, you know, living in New York City, I lost my job, I lost my home, I lost everything that created the structure for me in New York. And somehow it just spiraled me into a trajectory into moving to San Diego, where everything just kind of aligned, like the pathway of my journey, just you know, kind of how we, it just removes blockages, right? It removes all of these blockages and kind of propels you forward um, into whatever it is that is calling you towards your destiny, your purpose, whatever you want to call it. And um, 
yeah, it's it's been a whirlwind and I've been here in San Diego for the past uh, six years building the community and building um, just a, a safe space for people to come and do the work and heal. Um, you know, in, in the beginning, it was a little bit more of just kind of free form, but um, as I've gotten more familiar with what people actually need beyond just the medicine. They do need the integration, right? They do need the support. They do need um, to be able to do work outside of the medicine. We're not creating a codependency on the medicine. It's not, a, it's, it's um, non addictive, but it is really important. And the work that I'm doing now as an empowerment coach, as a spiritual mentor is really giving people the tools to do the work beforehand and doing the work after and not looking at the, at the medicine as a magic pill to solve all their problems and heal all their things because that's not possible we have to actually do this work and be committed to our own healing um, and utilizing all different types of um, holistic medicine you know what whether it's meditation whether it's you know energy healing whether it's yoga whether it's uh, any you know ketamine there i have actually some clients that that are using ketamine um, therapy to get off of their medication so that eventually they can come to an ayahuasca ceremony. And so, you know, I see the value in all of it and um, and just how beautiful this, you know, the psychedelic community is in supporting people to heal the trauma that is underneath the addiction. And, and really the addiction is just a byproduct of unhealed and unresolved pain and wounds that are in the spirit, that are in the energetic body that are stuck. And, and then utilizing these, these plant medicines to really, um, allow us to purge that from our being, right? A lot of people tell me I'm very light. I'm like, well, I, I unload often, you know, and, and sometimes you meet people that are in, you know, that are still uh, dealing with addiction or going through, you know, their healing journey. They're heavy, we're heavy with trauma. We're heavy with um, unprocessed emotion. We're heavy with pain. We're heavy with things that we didn't even know we were carrying, right? And so these medicines are able to give us that access point and allow us to see things and, and to really reprogram and build new neural pathways in our brain of how we're perceiving our past and how we are, um, perceiving ourselves, right? And, and really building um, building ourselves back up. A lot of people that I've seen, you know, with trauma, it's because they, they never had support as children or they, they had abuse as children or they were, you know, all of, you know, sometimes we're not even dealing with those major traumas, but other smaller traumas when we're just like unworthiness, you know, self-doubt, um, insecurities, relationship, pain, and, and things like that. It's just, we carry so much. And so it's really about um, the way that I like to look at it. It's, it's an unlearning and it's a remembering of who we truly are in our true spirit, the power that we hold as, you know, as these souls that came here to be here in our bodies, you know, and to live here on this earth, like who we truly are at our core and, and unlearning all of the conditioning and all the programming that we've experienced, um, through our through our lives and unfortunate events. So, um, how am how am I on time? I think that was that was it, right? Um, Pretty good. Than, yeah, I'm good on time. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Diana. And I love bringing the the religious and spiritual and traditions and the cultural perspectives. I mean, I think one of the things that I've often thought about is just how culturally homogenous the kind of the dominant narrative of recovery has been in spite of the underpinnings in, in the actual history of recovery and the importance of, um, you know, indigenous healing circles and the incorporation of that influence on the development of mutual aid societies. Um, they talk about this in the preamble of the, the Red Road, the, the Red Road to Albriety book, um, talking about the history of, of Native American efforts and the understanding that there was a spiritual sickness came from the, the healing, you know, methods and, and understandings of indigenous cultures. And so being able to honor sacred plants, being able to honor the relationships that we have with ourselves and, and with our environment and with our medicine and our food um, is really important in being able to grow our concept, our self-concept of um, what a self-defined recovery can look like 
um, especially as we broaden our, our cultural horizons to, to welcome people who live in cultures that um, participate in ceremonies with sacred plants as a part of their, their cultural traditions. Um, these are vital activities that have existed for thousands of years and have served a role and function in society to preserve the well-being of people living in those cultures and within those societies. Um, so understanding how that works and understanding how to respect that and honor and celebrate diversity within our movement is part of the utmost important conversation surrounding psychedelics, and especially as we move into therapies and patentability. There's a legacy of biopiracy that underscores the, the psychedelics movement, you know, from the expropriation of psilocybin mushrooms from Mexico and the current conversation happening um, federally around the patentability of psilocybin and psilocybin assisted therapies and companies really making serious efforts to try to restrict access or create traditional ownership from sacred medicines that belong to indigenous peoples uh, who have rights and who ought to rightfully be benefiting from that knowledge being shared with the world. And so kind of revisiting our own conversation about you know, how these things are being brought into the world and what are the elements of structural violence that are being deepened or, or furthering inequalities um, because these incredible medicines are being used now to help so many people and, and who, who are the rightful bearers of that knowledge, of that wisdom to, to, to be able to bring that forward to the benefit of our movement. Um, so I want to, I want to hand things over to Catherine, because I think this is an excellent departure point into, into her story. And then hopefully we'll be able to address some more questions and maybe into more of like an open discussion format. So without further ado, Catherine. Hey there. Thanks, Mikey. Um, so I'm coming from a very uh, different recovery background than many people typically think of um, with an eating disorder. There's no point at which I stopped eating food. <laughs> it's not an option. Um, so learning how to be, be in relationship to it was definitely a struggle. Um, and it's a struggle for traditional therapists, I think, to even teach you how to do that. It's a totally different um, thing than just cut out the alcohol, cut out friends. You can't stop being friends with people who eat food. So um, I wound up being very, very lucky. I found a therapist who was specialized and on the cutting edge of like psychological approaches for people with eating disorders and teaching them relationship. And I made a lot of progress, um, but still had my lapses of binge purge at least once a month when I was in high stress situations or whatever. And I also, that being the backstory, had this um, history uh, that wound up becoming this eating disorder where I was raised in an incredibly sheltered religious um, family, not family, but like my community at that point was incredibly religious and very um, closed to typical things that you would see in normal culture, like sexuality and um, I don't know, just enjoying music and recreational pleasurable experiences. My life felt very uh, dark, closed. I became a little bit OCD in various ways. Um, and when I broke out of that, I lost all of my friends. Um, I wound up not having any kind of a community support when I realized like, oh, there's something here that's not working. And I was having panic attacks every night worrying that I was going to go to hell for forever and all of these things um, that I was struggling with. And so fast forward a few years, my friend says, oh, I got tickets to this incredible festival. We're going to go. And I was like, oh my God, this is a cool, normal people thing to do. Um, and I would really, really love to do this. And I was terrified. I went kicking and screaming. I was like, oh my God, but the carbon emissions and yada, 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 and really struggling to own like my shadow, my desire to enjoy my life. And like, be a part of the mainstream experience. Um, I had a lot of fear around that and a lot of shaming and all of this sort of stuff, but eventually it won out. I got myself there and I was um, gifted 
a psychedelic called MDA. And I was promised <laughs> that it was going to be a great experience, that I didn't have anything to be afraid of. And well, I don't think that this is a general best practice approach necessarily. Um, it was the one that worked for me. I felt the way that this person explained it to me, the setting that I was in, the people that I was with, um, that this was going to be a good thing for me to try. Um, and so I went, I did it. And while I was under the influence of this experience in this recreational setting with lots of various people, I, um, I started to break down a lot of these negative OCD, fearful, um, shaming patterns that I had of relating with people. I was often post cult, um, trying to watch people and see like, okay, how do normal people function in society? And, um, it could almost be perceived as manipulative. I do feel that I was an empathetic, caring person. I really desperately wanted to see how do people have relationships and all of this stuff. But under the influence of the substance, MDA, um, and I think there was a little bit of marijuana involved, I stopped doing that. And I started actually talking to people for the intrinsic joy of being with this person. And it didn't matter if I thought like, oh, this person has a high status or this person is attractive. And so they're going to understand the world better. I wound up being like, oh, this person lights me up. I actually genuinely want to be connected with them for the simple sake that it feels good. Um, and so I came down from this experience and the rest of the week I was there with my best friend and I was processing out loud and saying, oh my God, like I've never operated this way in my life. Like it was always like, well, what would God want? Or what is, which after I left this hyper-religious community, I wound up focusing on political stuff. Like, oh, what's the best for the environment? What's this? And very OCD and pretty much um, paralyzed in a lot of ways. And I also was trying to fit in um, and I was beginning to speak about how like, I never wanted to go back to that way of relating. Like I'm not going to apologize for my past anymore. And so I was able to tell her the story through the week. And after that, um, I really did change my life. My life has not looked at all the same from before that moment since then. I came home and I made some major life changes. I changed where I lived and all of my friend group um, not that I had that many friends, but I had friends. I finally had a friend group. Um, and I also wound up becoming polyamorous. So I was like less OCD about rules and felt freer to explore my life and my internal reality as it was and be honest with myself. And I was also able to change my job into helping people also experience pleasure authentically and taking the stigma and the shame out of enjoying life intrinsically for the sake of it and being motivated by internal desire. To me, it feels like the opposite of depression or the opposite of anxiety. It's living with authenticity. So the things that I would like to offer to this conversation are um, a few points, which are integration. Not everybody's experience looks the same um, for entering into psychedelic use, uh, even therapeutically, um, and then also community. Uh, so I'll start first, a little bit out of order, um, with not everybody's journey into this looks the same. And I will say that even though I have now taken many trainings in harm reduction and how clinical settings work and stuff like that, um, as somebody who is homeschooled, religious, all of these things coming up, trusting the establishment or an establishment um, was not going to work for me. I was not going to do that. I'm not a jump off the cliff kind of person. I'm like big toe, foot, ankle, calf, and then we'll see if this water works for me type of individual. And so I had the opportunity to do that for a 
a couple of years before my most profound experience that I just shared. Um, and that worked for me. I've had lasting change because I actually got to do the thing as opposed to being like, I'm supposed to do it this way. I'm supposed to do it that way. So yeah, I think that that's an important thing for people to realize is to listen to your intuition um, and to do what feels comfortable with some rationality, intelligence, do your research, and then from that place, figure out what you feel most comfortable with. Um, my second point would be integration. I was incredibly lucky. One of my besties who met me right out of cult life um, and had been there with me the whole time. She was definitely like sorority girl, frat sister, whatever. She's just like, I don't know, an interesting individual who always really accepted me and like my natural innate gifts that I came into this world with. And watching her have empathy and hear my story and really accept it was incredibly, um, it gave me a lot of self-confidence to move forward and be like, this, this does sound good. Like, it's not just me. Like I can see it in her face that like, this is a beautiful, worthy thing for me to pursue. Cause I didn't have that kind of self-love. I was always looking for like, like, is this okay with God or is this okay with my community or whatever? I'm like, oh yeah. And so integration, talking about it, putting the frame around your experience. And I would say sooner rather than later in whatever way, again, it doesn't have to look the same. Maybe you are a person who does great with journaling, but for me, getting it literally out of my body and out of my sound, my, my thought space was incredibly helpful because when I'd start to say these things out in the world or do something out in the world, I could remember hearing myself talk about, I'm not chasing approval. I'm like living my life for me and which was, that is sustaining, that is fulfilling. I didn't feel the need to use food to like shut myself up, to be able to just watch people around a table and like just see like, oh, this is what they're doing or use food to like punish myself or have to purge to like settle my anxiety of like not being who I thought I should be or not being able to connect with people the way that I wanted to. And so, which brings me to my last point, which is my last of three points, which is community. And it is sort of the same as integration. It's part of it, but it's a massive part of it for me. Um, being able to be around individuals who honor um, what's my reality, people who understand psychedelics and support psychedelic use, um, and being able to talk about that freely with them, even use psychedelics with them to even create more connective experiences and share more authentically about issues as they come up and things like that. Um, it's just been one of those things that just helps to create and sustain a more fulfilled, safe, integrated life. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that those are some of the things that really helped me was the, the the after part is so important to the experience itself and that lasting sustainability. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. And yeah. one of the things you brought up really made me think back to what we talk about often in harm reduction, which, yeah. you know, it's actually a very old concept. You know, Dr. Norman Zinberg um, talks about the importance of not only knowledge about the drug and its effects, or in, in the case of native culture, sacred plants, um, and their effect, but also your set, your internal mindset. So your, your attitude towards the experience and towards yourself, mm -hmm. um, your state of preparation. And it's important to point out that integration starts or can start before yep. having an experience. And it, it's really helpful to be able to work with a professional, whether it's a clinician or if you're pursuing a traditional perspective, a guide or a shaman um, who's experienced and knowledgeable in, in the use of either a sacred plan or a, a, a prescribed drug um, to achieve a particular benefit. And so you begin that process early on and then that work continues after, you know, and just to kind of paraphrase one of the things that really stood out to me from, from Dr. Grunman's presentation that I shared in the chat for folks to watch at their leisure is that there's some really profound work happening in ketamine 
in the two weeks following the administration of the dose. There's tons of random neuronal activity. We know that psilocybin mushrooms help encourage the production of new stem cells in the brain. And, and, and those resources can be used to, to increase the benefits, but they can also magnify the propensity for harm. And so being able to create a safe space, being able to channel that effort, um, rally those resources to where they're needed most uh, is really important in being able to promote a healing experience where integration does essentially two things simultaneously. It can maximize the benefits and help you to apply those in your life in a way that's sustainable and in a, on an ongoing basis, but also to minimize some of the potential for harm. I mean, I think it's a really important point that I think this panel has has struck a balance between the, the benefits, but also there is some risk attached to this. When we talk about doing ayahuasca, it can be a, a very difficult experience depending on where you are approaching your journey and what happens as a result. I've heard people who've gone through ceremonies who've compared it to a near-death experience and really having to give up the fight and 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 then something opening up on the other side of that and and so these experiences aren't all positive and they're not all negative but they're an opportunity they're an opening to explore you know new insights to um to challenge yourself to experience new growth um you know my experience of recovery you know i was not able to stop drinking alcohol until i had a sustained experience with psilocybin mushrooms and at the close of that experience where I was using yoga, meditation and psilocybin for about a year. And this was long before there were any recognized uses for that. I was just starting, I think, clinical trials at that time. Um, I found enormous benefits and my desire to drink completely went away. And I've never felt the same about alcohol again. And there, there was something about my relationship that changed. And so I just want to point out that there's something more to the substance use or the substance use disorder or the recovery process that is about the relationships that you have, whether it's with yourself, your community, with the substances that are in your life or not in your life, and how you choose to navigate those relationships, really being able to evaluate them and appreciate them in a way that doesn't look at everything as a black and white, this is good and bad. And those relationships change across the lifespan as our needs change as we reach different developmental milestones, part of the importance of indigenous traditions, you know, has been to address those changes during those milestones. That's why so many traditions in native culture are tied to age and are, are tied to different periods of time in a person's life when they're entering a different role or a different place in society to better understand how they fit into those roles within society, creating that container and that context for people to find meaning and to find connection and purpose uh, in what they're doing within not only their individual lives introspectively, but in an extroverted way as well, understanding how we fit into our larger environment. How do we integrate with nature and see ourselves as a part of a larger global community? And what does that membership mean, right? And so I think a lot of the spiritual work of sacred plants draws on many of those ideas and helps us to experience them in very profound ways. Um, so I wanted to thank all of our esteemed panelists. Uh, we have some time for some question and answer, a little bit of open discussion. Um, so I'd really encourage folks to uh, put their questions. I know we answered some questions in the chat. Craig was pretty excellent at addressing many of those points, but I also wanted to open it up to any of our other panelists who might be interested in, in taking some of those questions that have already been answered or or anybody to put new questions uh, for us to answer. We're happy to talk with you about our experiences. Someone did put a question in about maybe comparing and, and you know, microdosing LSD versus psilocybin versus ayahuasca versus ketamine. And I think it's an important thing to address. Um, yeah, because I, I tried to write in there like many roads into the forest and I think they all have their benefits. And I think that's where connecting with your community, seeing what's available to you locally, um, 
seeing what makes sense for you in terms of, do you want to attend more of like a community gathering and doing this in a circle, in which case doing more uh, indigenous routes and working with ayahuasca makes a little bit more sense versus is this more of an individual play working with a therapist, in which case, yeah, it's like looking at the legal medicines like ketamine and just, yeah, it's, it can be hard and maybe a bit daunting to choose what path to take. And that's where I think just connecting with people who are doing this work and learning a little bit about the different roads is, is very helpful. Um, thank you, Craig. Do you know if there's any difference between the S-ketamine and the ketamine in, in regards to treatment? I tried to put an answer to that one, um, but it kept knocking it off, maybe because I was using the word abuse. Um, therapeutically, we try not to work with the nasal spray as frequently, particularly with addiction recovery, because it's so easy to continue the use of the nasal spray. And just to reduce the risk of abuse and kind of overdoing the medicine, we use the oral lozenges, which again, like you're way less likely to abuse that style of medicine. And um, it gives you a two hour experience and it's not short. So a lot of people don't want to do it uh, recreationally. So we, we tend to work way less with the nasal spray, but it is an option. And <clears throat> I think people use it more so to just manage depressive symptoms and, and things like that. But therapeutically, we're using oral lozenge ketamine or intramuscular dosing ketamine in our, in our setting. Um, and, and way less uh, the, the nasal ketamine and the S-ketamine. Mm. Thank you, Craig. I do also want to point out just some general kind of harm reduction. It's important as a kind of a general disclaimer and reminder that, you know, the use of most psychedelic substances, you know, outside of a clinical or religious environment is still heavily criminalized and carries severe penalties in many areas. There are a number of spaces and in, in states and in, in municipalities they're now moving towards decriminalization. Um, there's been a shift towards um, wanting to reduce um, that. And I did see the question from Tammy. Um, yeah, so D Dr. Nico Grenman, who was not available to be here because of um, technical issues with internet, um, runs a practice called Ember Health in New York City. In fact, um, they're getting about somewhere between a 60 and 70%, I believe, approval rating from Medicaid reimbursement to be able to provide ketamine assisted therapy. They have two clinics in New York City. Uh, it's called Ember Health. Uh, and so they do provide uh, ketamine assisted therapy here in New York, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the administration of that. Uh, there are quite a few practices uh, within the state of New York providing ketamine assisted therapies. Um, and another really important piece, and, and this is really specific to to ayahuasca, but it touches on some of the larger challenges with plant medicine. You know, oftentimes we move towards a medical model that really favors a, a heavy route of um, clinical trials. And one of the challenges with plant medicine, in particular ayahuasca, uh, because it's not just a single substance, it's actually a, a vine combined with another plant to be able to produce the, the effects of ayahuasca, um, they've actually found it virtually impossible to patent or standardize the ayahuasca formula. And, and, and it really speaks to the, the power of the spirit of the plant and the people who are working with that spirit who understand how to use it. There are medicines that are available within traditional cultures that are impossible to regulate or to make available through the traditional medical model because of some of the limitations on our science, right? And so there's a larger conversation that has not been had about how do we integrate indigenous practices and traditional medicine and honor and recognize it within Western medicine that takes a slightly different avenue, maybe a phytotherapeutics avenue. Um, the conversation being had around coca as a, as a extroverted entheogen in Latin America right now is also kind of fraught with many of the same challenges, as well as cannabis. There are just so many properties of the cannabis plant that we don't fully understand and yet have immense medicinal value. Um, and so I just mentioned that to say that there, there are gaping holes in the development of treatment and therapies that are based on the limitations on our scientific process and the process of receiving an FDA approval for a licensed medication 
that when we start to talk about plant medicine, when we start to talk about um, traditional medicine, um, there have not been answers provided. And frankly, the answer has been there are no answers. Um, and so there have been kind of divergent paths that have emerged to making access available for people who are seeking um, traditional healing, where one is a medical model very much with the, the ketamine therapies have followed that model um, and are pretty tightly regulated and controlled and can be. Uh, but in the case of ayahuasca, it's really dependent upon the, the wisdom and the, the experience of the practitioners who have been carriers of these traditions for, for many thousands of years. Um, and those formulas are so incredibly complex that they're almost impossible to regulate in any kind of standardized fashion. And the importance of the traditions surrounding those, um, you know, really pointing back to the importance of the set and the setting um, and, and knowing that living in the United States right now, so many of these medicines are criminalized that it creates a hostile environment for people who are looking to explore these opportunities more. And so being able to, you know, provide, you know, a judicious consult to people who are interested in exploring these avenues to weigh the pros and cons of the benefits in their lives and also being able to be realistic about the, the reality of criminalization and being licensed professionals, you know, working in licensed facilities that have a particular role, there may be ethical dilemmas to consider when discussing activities with individuals that are fundamentally criminalized. And, and that can inform meaningful advocacy for the need to change some of that, um, some of that landscape. So we can have honest and forthright conversations with people about the decision-making process and what they're considering and providing them with the best evidence that's available. There are to date 3,500 papers that have been published on ketamine assisted therapy. Um, you know, MDMA and psilocybin therapy are very quickly following that. There have been a handful of papers published in ayahuasca. Um, so the research is starting to, to be drawn together to inform some of these practices, but it's not a, a replacement for traditional wisdom. It's also not a replacement for the, the existing legal or penal system and so really being honest with ourselves about addressing and undoing the harms of that and and how do we move forward in a way that really centered on the values of our recovery the transparency the honesty the supportive community and the, the radical love and compassion that that we're asked to practice as we begin supporting people on their healing journeys thank you Teresa, for sharing the link um so what is the can average loss? Can I just add something to what you just yes, said? Yeah. Um, regarding ayahuasca, um, I would definitely recommend that everybody that is considering this path to really, like you said, to do your research, but also be very careful with who you sit with and what kind of medicine. Um, there are many different types of ayahuasca. There, um, There's a Colombian uh strain of ayahuasca so like you said ayahuasca is a mixture of a vine and um the ayahuasca vine and the chacuna plant and so there's many different tribes many different traditions that will cook it in different ways we have different strains like there are different strains of marijuana there are different strains of ayahuasca so being very um discerning about who you sit with what kind of medicine um you're working with um the the integrity of the shaman and their lineage and their traditions to the jungle um and the integrity integrity of the group. Um, you know, I myself have found myself in situations where they may not have been in alignment with me in the work that I do. Um, they, you know, there are groups that are out here promoting um, some cult-like um, uh, <laughs> principles in their in their serving of the medicine. And so there is a lot of things that are out of alignment. And like you said, there's not a lot of um, there's just not a lot of people regulating this this space and so really using your discernment like um catherine using using your intuition to really be careful if you are um interested in exploring this path for yourself um and just really trusting your intuition and and really being 
very, very wary of this space because it is new and a lot of people are taking it on that might not be um, traditionally trained, that might not have the wherewithal to really handle um, a medicine of this magnitude. And yeah, it could potentially be dangerous. So there is a risk involved as well as, well as um, potential benefits. But yeah, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Diana. I, I just wanted to kick it to Craig really quick to just answer the question about um, me, me, uh, medical coverage and costs. And then I, I wanted to hand it over to Catherine really quickly to address one of the questions. In the yeah, so as far as I'm concerned in Colorado, there's only one agency that's getting ketamine therapy covered by Medicaid. It's a place called Clarisana. And I think they actually have multiple locations and they're trying to expand, but most private practice Ketamine therapists aren't taking insurance. So what we do do is we can send super bills and bill for an hour of individual therapy for the three hour ketamine sessions. But as I mentioned, like you're doing, you're mostly doing individual psychotherapy, a set of six ketamine sessions and then psychotherapy. So you can get the psychotherapy costs um, through your insurance, depending on if the provider takes your insurance, but the ketamine itself, um, there's no billable code for ketamine therapy right now, which is unfortunate. And hopefully we move in that direction. Um, but in terms of cost, individual psychotherapy, basic hours would be like 120 to 180 an hour for individual psychotherapy. And then the medicine sessions themselves are usually two and a half to three hours, and they could range from anywhere from 300 to $600, depending on your provider and what dose you're doing. And if there's one provider or two, um, and yeah, Ron could probably speak to his personal experience doing ketamine therapy as well. The infusions, I'm not, not as familiar with pricing, but that's kind of what you can look at for kind of the, um, private practice outpatient model. Thank you, Craig. And Catherine, was there a question you want to address? Yeah, um, someone was asking about, um, I'd love to be able to ask questions about how that was overcome, talking about how religion can be ingrained so much into an individual. Um, if that person has any more specific questions, then please type it in so that I can answer it now. Um, but it was incredibly difficult. I left that entire scene. Um, I wound up in a more or less genuine, but still maybe mildly manipulative way, um, dating my way into a very small school group. And they were incredibly intelligent human beings who were attracted to me. And so I was able to get even though I was a, a very difficult person to connect with and understand, I um, there were people that still, in spite of that, wanted to see me around more often. And so through that, I was able to get a friend group of people. And then gradually, over a long amount of time, was able to create genuine friendships. So that created the new community outside of the religion to be able to bounce ideas off of, talk to, et cetera. Um, and then unfortunately, then what happens is, is you still have these programmed ways of becoming OCD. So this happened not stating any political position is better than another. I happen to have then directly jumped into being in this very political liberal group. And so now my brain was still patterned for right, wrong. If you do something wrong, you go to hell, et cetera. And so I became very militantly liberal and I um, wound up still having all of these issues with right and wrong and not being an authentic human being and like being in my own experience and organic and bumping it back. So then I had that major experience that I outlined earlier with MDA and simply being on that substance and talking to individuals about things that weren't religion and weren't politics and weren't health. I happen to have a very sick mom who also was very involved in nutrition and so a lot of rights and wrongs around food. So um, yeah, being able to experience normal interactions on that substance were incredibly helpful. We are at the end of our time, guys. And I just want to remind everyone that if you want to continue this conversation to go to your